I think luxury has its own kind of moniker, but I would definitely say that better quality garments in general are something that people are coming to us, coming to us for. How can we keep a specific garment where it looks good longer? How are we using better fabrication? Can we put technology into the garment to help yes. resist breakdown of you know, garment fibers and fabrics to environmental conditions or human conditions. Um, and I think that's ex that's an exciting change. Welcome to Clothing Culture, a fashion industry podcast at the intersection of technology and innovation. I'm Emily Lane. And I'm Brett Schnitker. We speak with experts and disruptors who are moving the industry forward and discuss solutions to real industry challenges. Clothing Culture is produced by Stars Design Group, a global design and production house with more than 30 years of experience. Welcome back to another episode of Clothing Culture. We have a special episode. You know why, Brett? It's the last episode of the season. Can you believe it? Time flew. I know, it really did. And, you know, don't be uh, don't be too afraid out there. We do already have the next season really pretty mapped out. So we will only be gone for a short while. But in this episode, we're planning to talk a little bit about what's next in the fashion industry 2024. I can't believe it's 2024, let alone the end of another season. I'm still writing 2023. <laughs> so a few more months, maybe I'll catch up. Yes, it's always how it is. So we have, uh, you know, quite a few things that we can talk about with regards to our industry and things that we're seeing um, trending, not just to the wearer, but things that are influencing our industry as a whole. Let's start with, I think, one of the more exciting topics that we really saw come to light in 2023. And I think more companies are going to be putting them into practice this year. You know what I'm talking about, Brett, AI. Yes, for sure. It, it, it. It's an amazing technology. You know, there's obviously two sides to every story, but our experimentation and experience with AI as it relates to design um, has been really fascinating. Um, first time I saw some generations that the team had put together, you know, they it takes, it's not like you just say a word and all of a sudden there's a mm -hmm. magical collection that shows up. Yeah. You know, there's still a lot of work that goes into, um, I guess, sort of, training AI into what you're specifically looking for with respect to a, a particular style or trend or whatever. But, yeah, you're but, still kind of art directing you're AI. You're directing, yeah, yes. it's very interesting. And then, but the results uh, blew my mind. I mm -hmm. mean, goosebumps, I was yeah. just super excited. Um, and it's, uh, it's interesting when you originally think about computers, robotics, you know, you don't associate creativity Right. And I think with AI, we're really kind of discovering that computers can be creative. And the results are pretty astounding. It, it's absolutely amazing. You just, you're seeing something really fresh and different. Yeah. And uh, that is always really incredible to, to witness. And we're going to see AI in multiple forms of our industry, not just in design. Definitely communication, marketing, all mm -hmm. sorts of different areas for sure. Right. Um, supporting websites and yeah. um, curating selections for the consumer that are custom. So it's really going to have its an active role at all, really all facets of our industry. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> what about some of the um, things that we're seeing with regards to speed to market? You know, that's always been sort of a, well, not always, but it, as of the last 10 years or, or, or so, speed to market fast fashion has always been a big industry. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly... Big groups like Shein um, have discovered not only speed of manufacture, but direct distribution, um, which kind of opens a big can of worms. That di the direct distribution is usually managed under de minimis clause. They're not paying the duties and tariffs that that the uh, the American brands do when they mm -hmm. bring in bulk. And so, you know, that's kind of changing a little bit of dynamics where you can produce and then courier goods in, you know, directly mm -hmm. to clients. Um, and it, and it, 
accelerates, um, uh, you know, a lot of different things. Um, it accelerates uh, meeting customer demand. It mm -hmm. reduces costs, therefore people buy more disposably. And so, you know, for those that are the slow fashion, fast fashion uh, camps on either side, um, you know, it's not helping the reduction of fast fashion for sure. Right, yeah. It, but, you know, as a, on the consumer side, I totally see the allure. It's sure. like, you know, you, you order your cashmere sweater and yeah. two days later it shows. And there yeah. are there are some new players out there that have really take, taken a hold on their portion of the market. And there are some players in the U.S. taking advantage of this situation too. But, you know, for the most part, you know, you really look at, at the overall dynamic and say, you know, are we, is there an unfair competitive advantage for those that are, that are taking advantage of this loophole. Um, we'll see what the government ends up doing about that. Uh, but it is it mm. is part of something that speeds that up. The rest of the the rest of the manufacturing world um, is experiencing probably a little bit of the reverse. Mm -hmm. You know, since COVID, manufacturing has slowed down. You don't get that speed speed of manufacture that used to. And then as <clears throat> what do you attribute that to? I think shift uh, of production base too. So, you know, the world wants to run from China based upon mm -hmm. the stuff that's going on. And so they start to entertain new new areas of manufacture. The, the truth of the matter is, is China produces things better and faster than most other countries today. They've perfected the industrial engine. And so if you're moving from... China to other parts of the world, they just move slower. Their mm -hmm. infrastructure is, isn't as good. Their aggressiveness uh, and speed of manufacture is not as fast. Um, so that kind of slows down that pipeline. And so, um, you know, that's what complicates this whole speed to market thing. Now, you know, we're seeing this direct shipment to customer, which speeds up some transit, transit and creates a new, di new dichotomy for the for the overall industry. Um, but if you're using the traditional route, uh, shipping uh, on ocean containers for the most part, if you wanna be economical, you know, there are a lot of things that are really messing about with mm -hmm. speed to market for sure. You know, you've, you've mentioned a few things. You've, you've talked a little bit about, you know, uh, the government and you know, their, what's gonna be their reaction mm -hmm. to some of these workarounds to paying duties. You've mentioned duties. Um, let's talk a little bit about geopolitical and global conditions and their influence on the industry. Um, you mentioned China. You yeah. know, we, we've talked about that in previous episodes, this, this desire for people to move their manufacturing beyond China. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about those challenges. Um, you know, we're seeing some other other kind of uh, forces at play right now. Um, you know, Suez Canal, for example. Let's yeah, talk about sure. that. There's a lot of things. You know, you know, backing up to the manufacturing center in China. I think a lot of our politicians are being really short-sighted. We haven't developed a supply chain to offset the mm -hmm. mass amounts of goods that China has perfected. Um, yet we're putting a lot of pressure on that situation. Um, and that's going to indirectly affect the American consumer. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, and I would, I would urge that it, reviewing and understanding that most economists say that tariffs have never worked. Uh, today we've implemented tariffs. There's conversation that should a part a particular party get back in power, there's going to be raised tariffs and raised restrictions. Um, out of China, the ultimate cost is going to be to the consumer and the ultimate benefit of that increased tariff is going to be the government. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to, in basically, they're increasing taxation on the American consumer. Um, the American consumer will pay that, China won't. Um, and so I think that uh, it's an important thing to be aware of. You know, mm -hmm. for those that are in the industry, it does put pressure on them to seek other areas. I don't know if... Um, that kind of policy to increase tariffs while not having alternatives to manufacture will spread from China to other countries. But the ultimate, the ultimate result will be that American consumers will pay more 
and in our industry um, will we'll be experiencing with higher higher expenses and higher costs across the board. Um, you know, the other cost impact and slowdown uh, tying back into the previous question is what's happening with the Houthi rebels and things like that in the Suez Canal. <clears throat> you know, war and conflict are something that we're getting very, very used to in all sorts of different parts of the world. I would have thought we would have evolved to do, as a mm -hmm. human race, but we still have people that, that unfortunately, for whatever reason, believe war is an answer. Um, and the conflict that exists uh, impacting our business is that, you know, we, we're seeing it on the news this morning uh, and pretty much every morning now where, you know, trade routes are being affected mm -hmm. by um, one of the particular um, wars that are going on in the world. That's going to greatly extend our trade routes. The Suez Canal um, reduced um, freight time from Near East to the U.S. Um, now there are considerations, and I think some are actually implementing the uh, shift of boats to go around the Cape, mm -hmm. uh, the Cape of Africa, right. which is going to add a significant timeline. Some of the other answers are, if you're producing in places like India, instead of going west, you could go east. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, via Singapore and then into our West Coast ports. But infrastructure becomes a major issue. If you're shifting a massive amount of things that were split between the East Coast and the West Coast, and now they're all going to the West Coast, Backlogs. we're going to start to see yeah. major backlogs like what we saw during occurring COVID. during COVID. Right. So while you solve for the extended freight time, you will see large slowdowns in the ports. Okay, prepare. For, it's going to be yes. an interesting year, for sure. <laughs> um, you know, something that I was just thinking of, uh, you know, knowing some friends of ours in the industry and some of the challenges they've been seeing recently is related to cotton. Yeah. You know, knowing that we've got the uh, kind of the Xinjiang cotton band that, that, um, Takes twenty percent of the world's reserve right, off the table. Yeah, that uh, now you know cotton coming into the United States, states especially from China, is under greater scrutiny. Yeah, and um, and what's happening there? It's it's kind of crazy because goods are getting getting held up. If they there's a if they're lacking traceability, and so I'm wondering with those challenges, do you think that we can anticipate more synthetics? coming into our into There's play. already a prediction, you know, consumers like the fact that things are easy care. Mm -hmm. uh, synthetics are more easy care. So there was some estimates that synthetic would rise from 55 to 80% over the next Whoa. couple of years. Um, you know, because of some of the restrictions that we have in cotton. Cotton's also a super thirsty crop. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as we're talking about climate change issues, um, water reductions, things like that. You've got you've got a crop that can be really, you know, impactful on water yeah. supply. And so, you know, managing both those issues that that we would be seeing with, you know, clear global warming, um, reduction of of water supplies in some areas, um, uh, synthetics become more and more important as cotton becomes more and more expensive or in some cases could be more scarce because of either a political decision that we've made um, or a climate situation. So that really complicates the other trend that it could, consumers are eager to see um, really make uh, its way in the industry sustainability. This has been an ongoing topic for us and certainly <laughs> right. people dialogue that sustainability is going to be one of those big monikers for 2024 also. Sustainability, like I've said in other conversations, it's it's the industry's biggest failure as it relates to the, the fibers and the fabrics primarily. Uh, we've done a really good job uh, in parts of sustainability with the people part. Right. You know, over the years... Um, uh, we've really concentrated on employee and worker rights um, throughout the world uh, to varying degrees. 
And we just had a great episode on this. Where yes, we, yes, it was great. And I think that's one of the organizations that have really been um, impactful over the years uh, to change workers' conditions and at least monitor them to make sure mm-hmm. things are better. Um, we, we have other improvements like water reclamation mm-hmm. uh, is on the rise. Uh, solar power is on the rise. Uh, sustainable biofuel is on the rise. All of those things are kind of necessities for countries. Unfortunately, human beings kind of move by necessity, but we are seeing uh, positive movements in that respect. The number one failure still comes back to our fabrication, Mm -hmm. fibers and fabrication, especially when it comes to synthetics. As we move from more natural fibers to more synthetics, the the answer today in mass is polyester, nylons, things like that. Right. <clears throat> We've talked again about, you know, the the long periods that it takes for biodegrade, uh, biodegradability in landfills. Um, and there's just no real solutions out there that have scalability and value today. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's a continued conversation about sustainability But in our conversations, the challenging part, to be really frank, is that while people have the dialogue, they're pretty quick to shift when they start looking at longer lead times for sustainable fabrics, more expensive sustainable fabrics, limited design and limited fabrication in in each one of those categories. And in some cases, some of these um, sustainable organizations that are creating these unique fabrics they make it pretty exclusive. It's not like you can just go in and buy it and go. Um, sometimes you have to jump through a few hoops. Who are you? This is our right. brand. <laughs> and that's a very disappointing thing when we deal with sustainability. So I think we'll still have continued conversations about that. Um, and sustainability, the solution on sustainability is not one that we're going to solve immediately. Mm-hmm. So I think a continued cadence in, in the conversation um, and hopefully additional groups will weigh in Um, It would be great that some of the, like the 10 major poly producers around the world do embrace a scaled model uh, of biodegradable poly product, but uh, I'm not seeing that happening quite yet. You know, on the fiber side of things, we just had a really wonderful experience touring a factory in India where we got a chance to see recycled cotton in that process. It really helps me understand why this is more expensive and why it takes a lot more time. It's still a very human process. Yeah, especially the sorting uh, and shredding as you saw it. I mean, this is a large, large mill in India, one of the the largest, I would say. And and their entire unit that they dedicated to recycled poly was, was, um, recycled, uh, poly- sorry, recycled cotton, cotton yes. was a testament to um, to the commitment in that country that we're seeing in a lot of different areas. But yeah, when you're walking through and you're <laughs> seeing them shredding this stuff uh, together and then picking the fibers yes. under an ultraviolet light, pulling out hand some of the, sorting, yeah, hand pulling these fibers it was very, apart. Very, very interesting. Uh, you know how time consuming that was. I think part of the, the answer for sustainability is in this circularity of recycled cottons and or re- recycled polys. Um, you know, recycled poly only really gives you one more time through mm-hmm. uh, before the stuff becomes too brittle to be used in fabric. But it is, it, it is part of something that's going on. But circularity or, or the the change, or to, the change to slower fashion uh, is something that can also benefit sus- the sustainable mm-hmm. initiative where if we're buying better, we're buying uh, clothing that lasts longer, that is more uh, transcendent of fad, mm-hmm. uh, uh, much like many Europeans uh, practice, then the industry can actually be supported in such a way where Cost can rise, quality can rise. We're not focusing on the cheapest, lowest common denominator in terms of the cheapest fabric for fast fashion. But And we're uh, not over-consuming. And we're not over-consuming, landfills slow down. I think that that's a viable alternative. There is a lot of, um, there are a lot of studies out there that are having these conversations that if we were to just get specific percentage, subtle increases in costs throughout the chain, all parties benefit. 
I'm so glad you brought this up because this is a trend I was seeing uh, and, and, and really um, we're experiencing at STARS is luxury. We are getting more and more people reaching out with the desire to put better quality garments uh, out there for, for consumers. Yeah, I, I think luxury has its own kind of moniker, but I would definitely say that better quality garments in general are something that people are coming to us, coming to us for. How can we keep a specific garment where it looks good longer? How are we using better fabrication? Can we put technology into the garment to help yes. resist breakdown of you know, garment fibers and fabrics to environmental conditions or human conditions? Um, and I think that's, ex that's an exciting change. Um, and so hopefully that, that part in this overall conversation about sustainability is something that seems to be on the rise. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the actual fashion trends that we're going to see on people. <laughs> We have a wonderful friend, Sharon Grobard, who has launched SG Files, and we're really excited for her. She's just uh, the perfect blend between artist and trend uh, forecasting savant. And we've uh, had an opportunity to review her latest trend report. And I was excited about some of the things we saw in that. Yeah, she's so insightful when it comes to overall trends. I've seen uh, and read and looked at and yeah. all that, all of these different trend forecasting sites. And they all have kind of their purpose uh, in the industry for different levels of the industry. But Sharon's just shown over the years, one, you know, wisdom is created with how many years you've been in the business. And Sharon's mm -hmm. been in the business quite some time like me. And and I think that she, she's got a really good... Um, uh, connected insight into what's happening in fashion, but she's applying the practicality of what actually is going to come to the table. Yeah. And, and she distills it in such a way that's very, very clear, I would suggest anyone listening to the podcast that's looking at forecasting to uh, reach out and yeah. take a look at Sharon and her evolved company, SG Files, for sure. So one of the things that we've seen, uh, not only just with, with our clients and the things they're asking for, but we're, we're seeing great evidence of it um, out there, is this kind of um, gender blurring, much more, um, you know, people wearing what they want, how they want, and, yeah. and also, you know, yeah, kind of removing the idea of who wears what. Yeah, well, we talk that designers are just as much artists as people that paint with paint on a canvas. Mm -hmm. And artists, whether they're working in fabric or whether they're working in paint, they're influenced uh, by conditions and conversations and, you know, what's happening around them all the time. And certainly the, the overall conversation about um, acceptance for those that are marginalized in um, these various areas um, uh, are a topic. Mm -hmm. And when you have these conversations, the explosion in art to support that conversation, to bring it to light, you know, to talk about transgender and talk about... Um, uh, you know the challenges that society's having with 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 some of these groups and the desire to bring them into the fold and accept them and reduce the challenges that are going on where suicide rates are so high in transgender communities um you see it in mm -hmm. art and you see it in fashion art yeah. and that's on the rise and i think that um that that certainly is an influence in what's happening today. It's it's yeah. it's saying we accept, you know, many are saying that we accept um, human beings in all shape, sizes, uh, gender directions, yes. uh, religions. You know, it's celebrate those step forward. Celebrate the step forwards where yeah. people are saying, look, you know, we we just need to care about them. So we saw. Them. Yes, I I completely agree. Yeah. Um, and that's that's something very exciting that's yeah. happening right now. We saw, of course, during COVID, this, you know, comfort, the age of comfort come to the table. And we've talked a little bit about easy care fabrics and all of those things that really, really um, 
did well during these this sure. COVID time. Uh, there are some trends that really are now kind of counteracting some of that. We're seeing more tailored come into the mm -hmm. back into the fold, kind of as people are <laughs> ready to move beyond their PJs. Yeah, well, we're seeing once they're leaving their house, and there's yeah. some conversation about with all of us being connected to our phone and computers, how much we're leaving our house and socializing, mm -hmm. but we're certainly doing more of it than we did during COVID. And in that shift, obviously different markets are benefiting, outdoor sports in general, outdoor activities. And then when you could dress for mm -hmm. yourself, right? And now that you're out amongst uh, the population, look, we like to look good in yeah. whatever way that is. And uh, we like to express ourselves. And and fashion always has these kind of uh, life cycles. Mm -hmm. And tailored is certainly on the rise coming back, but tailored evolved. Tailor, mm -hmm. Tailored today is tailored plus comfort. Mm -hmm. um, the fabrications are stretched, the linings are stretched. There's lots more mobility, um, you know, tailored, pants still have drawstrings, the legs are getting more comfortable. Yeah. So it's always, there's always this evolution that embraces some of the things that we learned about, wow, I can put something on and feel really, really comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but how do I elevate the look? Uh, and then how do I ensure, I think there's always something in the back of some people's minds and hopefully it continues to grow. And how do I ensure this is more of a timeless decision? Right. Yeah, you mentioned something uh, also that the outdoor space, you know, yeah. that really saw a benefit during COVID times. And we're still seeing the influence of outdoor industry, like different sports, golf, for example, that has continued to um, flourish. Yeah. And we're seeing that influence in fashion today. For sure. And, you know, as technology and fashion, we keep talking about that being more and more uh, interconnected, outdoor sports, outdoor activities, uh, clothing that they that people wear doing all of these different things um, demand this kind of blend between, they still wanna look good outdoors, yeah. but they wanna have performance. And so uh, I think it plays right into all the major trends that are going on. Okay, as we wrap this up, is there anything else we should be um, either excited or celebrating or happy to see unfold in this 2024? Um, I think there'll be some interesting things in terms of supply and demand that are that are going to influence our industry. I think that pre-planning uh, mm -hmm. is going to be important for those that are in our industry from a supply mm -hmm. uh, perspective. Um, there's a lot of volatility that's going on today. Um, we've mentioned it, wars, yeah. political conditions. We've never been more separate as a country. Uh, we've got two factions, two sides, polarized more than ever. Upcoming elections make people nervous in general. We've talked about whether the recession or whether we've got inflation and nobody has any clue <laughs> from yes. day to day. So you're going to see ebbs and flows of demand. You're gonna see spurts of people feeling pretty good about the economy in general as, you know, we get rises in the stock market and so demand's going to be there. And with that challenge of supply chain, that's gonna sque squeeze the supply chain going back. And then we're gonna see some maybe moments of panic if things start to uh, drop in terms of our economy or challenges around the world. And so then we might have excess inventory. It's going to be a very, very interesting year with respect to um, uh, how we manage uh, our distribution and the amount of distribution to clients at particular times. Wow, thank you for ending on that positive note, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> we keep it real here. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, regardless, I'm excited to see what uh, what's gonna be unfolding with regards to technology, the continued influence of AI. And of course, I love seeing how people embrace trends and make it all their own. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. It will be a great, interesting, fun year, as most are. That's right. And we will be here to keep you posted on what's happening and, uh, you know, what uh, what's next in this great industry of fashion. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Clothing Culture. We will be back soon with another season coming your way. Don't forget to subscribe. Stay apprised of upcoming episodes.